Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Welcome everyone to the Sports Spectrum podcast. I'm Jason Romano. Great to have you on the show today. As always, you can reach us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at sports underscore spectrum. You can email me, Jason, at sportspectrum.com. And of course, we want to encourage you to subscribe. Subscribe to our magazine. Go to sportspectrum.com. It's just $18. What a deal for an entire year. That's basically less than $2 a month. And it's $18 for an entire year. Heck, buy a couple subscriptions for someone you know. But it's for our Sports Spectrum magazine. It's our quarterly magazine. You get four issues plus a bonus fifth issue, a welcome magazine, just welcoming you to the Sports Spectrum family. And the magazine's been around for 30 years. So it's a staple among many people who've subscribed. But I know we have a lot of new listeners here and a lot of new Christians, a lot of new people uh, listening to this podcast and, and getting to know about Sports Spectrum in our magazine, man, it's a great magazine. What a great tool to hand out to kids, teens, people who are huge into sports, but also you want to give them the good news as well. And I mean the good news of Christ. And so the magazine is a great way to do that. You can also get it for your men's ministry, for your church, for your sports team, wherever it might be. I highly recommend that you subscribe to the Sports Spectrum magazine. Go to sportspectrum.com, $18 for an entire year, and I promise you, you won't regret it. You'll love it. It's a great magazine. Go to sportspectrum.com and subscribe today. Today's guest on the podcast is George Schroeder. He's USA Today's college football national reporter, and George also does work for Sirius XM for their Big Ten and Big 12 uh, programming on the Sirius XM radio, satellite radio there, so you can check him out there as well. And George has been covering college football for a long time. He's in his seventh season now covering college football for USA Today. He's a graduate of the University of Oklahoma in Norman. He's married. He has three kids, Elizabeth, George, and of course, Christopher. And I say of course because Christopher and his story is the main reason we wanted to have George on the podcast. George, of course, in this podcast, we'll talk about his job and just covering college football and sort of the craziness that is college football, especially when you're in season. The fans are just nuts uh, about college football, and, and, and rightly so in a lot of ways because it's such a, a passionate sport and a fun sport to watch and be a part of. But even more than that, George uh, and I connected on Twitter a while ago, and I followed him and and, uh, you know, I, I obviously followed him to kind of get his thoughts on college football. But then he shared a few times on his Twitter page about his son, Christopher. And Christopher, when he was just six weeks old, had a heart transplant. And at 22 months old, had a kidney transplant. It's a lot to go through as a young boy. And uh, George was actually the one who donated the kidney to his son, Christopher. And that's the story I wanted to have George tell here on the podcast, a story of a father loving a son, a story of trusting in God through difficult times. What does that look like? And for George, you know, I'm always, uh, I guess, a little envious of people who can go through difficult times in their lives and continue to trust God. I know God is good all the time. We talk about that. And the Bible says that um, you know, that the Lord doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we trust in that and we rest in that and we, we believe that. But then life happens and it's hard to have this sort of flesh within us still trust in a God when we're seeing things happen around us that aren't exactly uh, great. And, and yet George walks us through his journey with his son Christopher and how he trusted in the Lord through that. So let's get to it right now. USA Today college football national reporter George Schroeder is our guest here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Take a listen. George, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I, I look forward to, uh, to talking with you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking to you as well, kind of following your path on, on Twitter, certainly for college football news, and, and that's the, the mainstay there. But I also see... Uh, you know, Romans 5.8 mentioned on your Twitter page, and certainly you talking about your faith, you know, where you can and when you can. So being a fourth faith in sports podcast, something I definitely wanted to have you on and kind of hear about your journey and talk to you about your 
your, uh, you know, your sports world and your personal world and your faith world as well. So let's start with the sports world. Uh, and just, I guess, from a, a working perspective, what is your day to day like covering college football from a national perspective? Well, it, it changes every day, Jason, is the main thing, I guess. But this time of year, we, you know, we're smack in the middle of football season. It's kind of a whirlwind, um, and it's, it's a fun whirlwind to be caught up in. But basically, you know, you're, you're writing stories, you're talking to people on the phone, you're, you're going places, uh, you're, you're kind of getting to do a job where a lot of people would have a – it'd be their bucket list to go see these cool games every week. And, you know, many weeks you're at that big game. And so it's – you know the the day to day changes to be quite honest, but it's um it's kind of a it's it's a little bit of a never never dull moment thing. Certainly this time of year, and then in the other parts of the year, um, college football dr- definitely drives the train in college sports. So so with the exception really of March Madness, when it's sort of all hands on deck at USA Today, with yeah. the exception of that, you're still writing about sort of the business of college sport through the prism of college football because it's sort of the driver of everything. So there are all sorts of opportunities to, uh, to talk to people and, and go and do things. And um, I mean, it's a tremendously fun job most of the time. What's the toughest part of your job, would you say? Maybe in season and out of season, what's the toughest part? On a personal level, it's as much as I love the travel and getting to go to the games, it's the travel and, and um, you know, being away from your family, I think. You know, when I was covering um, teams on a more local basis at, at, at other newspapers, um, I would have said that the most difficult part of the job is the lack of access that you can get and, and sort of the being viewed as an antagonist or the relationship being antagonistic. And that's still the case to a certain point. But when you're at a national outlet, they kind of roll out the red carpet a little bit for you. And so I appreciate that and try to take full advantage of it. Um, you know, so that's changed a little bit. I, I guess I would say that the little bit of the work-life balance as it relates to travel has been um, the toughest part. Uh, you know, I have three kids, um, and you, you hate to miss some of their activities um, because you're gone on the weekends. And, you know, other dads who work sort of normal jobs are, you know, free on Friday afternoon and Saturday and, and that kind of thing. So that's hard uh, sometimes. Where did the passion, you've covered college football pretty much your whole career. Where did that passion for college football begin? Was that something that was at an early age and you were just like, this is the sport, this is the one I love, or did it come once you got your first job? I think when you grow up in, in the South, and I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, um, and so I learned a lot of very important things very early, including beat Texas <laughs> and hogs smell good, right? Those yeah, are right. some of the things. I think you when you um, when you grow up in a place where there's a passion for a college team, that's sort of how it happens. And I was a college basketball fan too. Don't get me wrong, but it was all about Arkansas. Um, and so those are my roots. You get that. You kind of get that beaten out of you, and you sort of divorce yourself a little bit from the specific fandom that you grew up in because you're covering the sport. And so I've I don't I don't really have a team now, but that's where the passion started. I mean, I, I lived and died as a child. Um, with how Arkansas played on Saturday. And so this was back in the day when you'd go to church and you'd still wear like a, a sports coat as a kid sometimes. You know, you didn't <laughs> yeah. wear flip, flip-flops and shorts to church any, at that point. And uh, I, I had a little lapel pin. It was an Arkansas. It was like a little Razorback, right? And so you could always tell how I felt. It was sort of my mood. Uh, and it was always based on the game on the day before. If they'd won... It was right side up. If they lost, it was upside down, and it was very intentional. So I don't know if that's a great answer, but, I, man, I grew up an Arkansas fan, and I think you just sort of have that, that kind of passion. Yeah, you mentioned that word passion, being a national college football writer. There just never seems to be a dull moment, especially this time of year in the fall with, with college football during the season. Can you kind of describe for our listeners, we got a lot of listeners from who are in the South for sure, but there is a lot of listeners who may not be giant, diehard college football fans. Just explain that passion. Maybe describe that passion that fans have for the game and maybe an example or two of where you've seen that passion on display. Well, I mean, it's, it's hard to explain unless you're kind of soaked in it, you know, and, and living in it or have at least spent some significant time in and around it. But it's a part of the fabric of everyday life. I mean, um, it's what people want to talk about when they gather um, at the coffee shops. And, and, and there are people in every southern state, and, and it's not just limited to the south, but um, 
college football fans who have never, not only didn't attend the school, have never been on campus, never attended a game, who love that team. And it's, it's one of the more important parts of their life. And it, you know, I mean, when I moved off to Eugene, Oregon to, to write columns for the newspaper there, um, I didn't really know what to expect. And I found basically a fan base that was at least as rabid and passionate as any I'd been around in the other parts of the country that I had worked in and, and, and in Arkansas that I had lived in. And so it, it, to me, there's some universal characteristics there. For some reason, it's about pride in your place. I mean, we could get really deep here, and at that point, I'd be way out of my element. But <laughs> it's pride in your place. It's sort of a, a common sort of universal thread that runs through the people of that place. Um, and it's a uniting force, even though, you know, you might be divided by politics or religion or whatever else. You, you love, you know, in, in, in my case, everybody loves the hogs, right? And, and that's what it was like when I was growing up in Little Rock. And it's the same way. You know, if you grew up in Alabama or, uh, you know, Oklahoma or you, you can kind of name the place, these sort of college football hotbeds. It's the same way. Everybody loves that team. Sometimes there's a rival <laughs> and yeah. so everybody hates the other team and vice versa. But it's just I, I don't really know how to explain it other than it's a phenomenon that I don't think there's there's the same passion uh, to the same with the same number of people, maybe in anything more than in anything like college football in, in at least in American society. I, look, I know a lot of people love their pro teams. The NFL is a hugely popular. It feels like it's a different kind of, a different kind of passion. Yeah. And, and did you, can you just, can you give me an example or give our listeners an example of just one of the places in where you've seen insane, crazy, I can't believe this goes on and not in a bad way. I mean, just in how passionate their fans are. Uh, can you pick one? I know they're all unique and different. You mentioned Alabama and Oklahoma. Can you pick one where it's just such a unique setting every single time they have a home game? Yeah, I mean, you. let me think for a second. Look, I happen to, to think Texas A&M is one of the cooler places in the country, and obviously they were in the old Southwest Conference and they were in the Big 12, and then, you know, six years ago they moved to the SEC. Yeah. And, and I think their fan base fits the SEC, although it was fine in the other leagues. Um, that's a place where, um, when you go to the press box and they redid the stadium and this still happens when they completely blew up and rebuilt the stadium, this still happens. You go to Texas A&M and you sit in the press box or you sit in the upper deck and they play the Aggie war hymn. And at a certain point in the Aggie war hymn, everybody locks arms and begins to, um, uh, sway together to the music and the press box or the upper deck sways. And it's a disconcerting feeling. Because I keep thinking to myself, all right, look, I understand that Texas A&M uh, produces a bunch of engineers, so I should not feel terrible about this. But I really don't like the fact that I'm, you know, X hundred feet above the earth and the structure is swaying <laughs> and that they're doing it on purpose. Right. That's I don't know if that's a great answer for sort, sort of the passion, but it's one of the unique places. And it's one of those places where I always tell people, if you get a chance to go to a big game at Kyle Field and College Station, you should do that in every place has that you go to Florida field and they're revved up and excited about the Gators. And it feels like you're sitting inside a jet engine. Hmm. Um, you go to Mississippi state and you better bring, you better bring some earplugs because the, uh, the uh, cowbells uh, will make your ears almost bleed. But it's all of those little things are sort of unique to each place. Uh, and it's just such a cool, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I kind of embrace each, each place for its different unique quirks. And they're, you know, most of them are really, really cool. We're talking to George Schroeder here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast, USA Today College Football's national reporter. And it's the Sports and Faith Podcast, as we like to call it here, George. And we like to find out and hear people's testimonies, uh, how they came to faith in the Lord. So can you share that with us and where that faith started to take shape for you? Yeah. I mean, I grew up in Little Rock, as I said earlier, um, and, and grew up. Uh, in a family uh, where my parents were committed um, followers of Christ. And so I was in church, you know, every time the doors were opened and uh, made a profession of faith when I was nine. Uh, looking back, I don't believe probably that I actually um, was saved at that point. In my mid-20s, uh, I started working for my hometown newspaper, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. And um, through a variety of factors, a, a supervisor, uh, a good friend of mine, um, the supervisor came to Christ 
And a good mm-hmm. friend of mine began to uh, follow Christ to a degree I hadn't seen him do before. And we were roommates, he and I. And I began to be convicted of things that I, I knew were true based on the, you know, what I'd learned growing up and all those times at church. But I also knew that I, I wasn't um, following Christ. And so uh, there, was a, there was a night in my mid-20s when I, when I remember clearly uh, going out on the back porch of the, of the house we were living in at the time and, and saying, Lord, I know um, that the way I'm living is wrong. I understand that I'm a sinner and I need you. And I, and, and I want to follow you and give you my whole heart and my whole life. And that's the day that I point to um, where I, I believe I became a Christ follower. And I wish I could tell you that it was all sort of a straight upward trajectory from that point. But, um, you know, life and career and all sorts of things have been more important to me at various times than following Christ. And it's really only been in the uh, you know, uh, I don't, I don't really know the last decade or so, maybe that I've said, God, you're Jesus, you're not an accessory to my pursuit of uh career or um, wealth or fame or whatever else. Not that I've achieved any of those kinds of things, but you know, we, we sort of pursue these things as sort of part of our American dream. It's only been the last decade or so that I could truly tell you that, that I've begun, begun to sort of see who Christ really is and how much he's worth and, and should be worth in, in my life and my heart and, and, and how I should follow him. But it's been a, it's been a gradual process. And, you know, I pray every day that I see him as worth everything. Yeah. You mentioned uh, over the last decade, there is a moment that we're going to talk about in a minute that I know took place with your son that I, I really want to dive a little deeper into, but I'd like to ask you real quick before we get to there about becoming, uh, not becoming a Christian, I guess, but being a follower of Christ and kind of taking that more seriously and still having a job to do and being, you know, a person who covers sports and navigating, I guess, the world of sports and of faith and work and faith, I guess. It's always a little tricky. How did, how did that unfold for you in your journey? Were you always able to, or were you keeping it separate? Were you able to kind of fold your faith into your work? You obviously can't go around preaching to people every day. You got a job to do, but how did those two sort of intersect for you? Well, I think there have been times in my, and this would go back to kind of what I was telling you, there have been times when I would try to compartmentalize, which I, I think is fundamentally the wrong way to be. I mean, being a follower of Christ is supposed to infuse everything you do. And it's yeah. supposed to become your life. And so there's certainly been times when I would have compartmentalized and, and, and kept those separate wrongly. Um, I, and you're right. It's not, it's not a kind of thing where you can overtly all the time say, Hey, you need to know Jesus. Right. Um, it is, however, a, a job or any job you, you need to say, God, I'm doing this for you. So would you give me opportunities to tell people about you or at least to show them sometimes that, you know, I'm, I'm following you and, and maybe I'm different than the next guy. Hopefully that's the case. Uh, and then the other thing I think, and I think this is really important in our, in work is uh, I should want my work to be excellent so that it brings glory to God. Um, and that, and so that frankly, you know, maybe somehow within the writing, but maybe it, maybe it's not within the writing that day or whatever it maybe somehow it points people to, to Christ, or at least shows there's a difference. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that I achieve that all the time or even routinely, but I think that's the goal. So, um, you know, there have been opportunities throughout my career at different times when you get to know people. It's not necessarily in that first interview with somebody or even the 10th interview with somebody. Sure. But when you get to know people, whether it's the interview subject, which is probably where you were going, yes. or maybe it's your colleagues, um, competitors, colleagues at the same outlet, whatever, um, you get to know those people. And they realize that you have um, a faith in Christ. And at some point, you're able to share that with them. And that's, that's sort of my hope and my goal. Hmm. We're talking to George Schroeder here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Let's go to the story of your son, Christopher. Um, I, I've seen you share it a few times on social media about him. Um, and I'd, I'd like you to just kind of tell us from, you know, from the audience perspective, you know, take us back to the beginning. I know it was eight years ago. I think he's eight years old now that he was born. Tell us about him and, and really the miracle you've seen God do in his life. Yeah, man, I appreciate it. And God, and it, that is what it is. Um, he'll be nine on November 30th, uh, by the way. So, mm-hmm. um, 
but he was a surprise. Christopher's our third child. Um, we were surprised to learn that uh, we were going to have a third child and, and, and excited. And then we found out, um, you know, I don't want to give away the plot too early, but <laughs> that okay. he had multiple heart defects. Hmm. And so there was, there was a legitimate question and serious concern whether he would make it the term. And then as things began to continue to move, um, and, and he continued to not just survive, but seemed to thrive, you know, in utero, then they, they kind of came up with this idea that we're going to have this series of three surgeries, one at about a week to repair this malformed heart, I guess I should have said, one at about, uh, three months and then another at about three years to sort of patch up the issues. And, um, so he was born and we were very excited. And then, on you know, day five or six, he crashed. And they revived him. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll never forget sort of getting the call at, you know, early in the morning. We were at a Ronald McDonald house where we'd been staying. We, we, you know, he, he'd been a high-risk pregnancy. And so uh, we were at a children's hospital in Portland, Oregon. We were living in Eugene. Mm-hmm. Portland's 110 miles away, the closest uh, children's hospital. And your son's crashed. We stabilized him. And, and at that point, suddenly that first plan, the three surgeries over a course of weeks, months, and years, was out the window. Uh, and a couple of days later, um, we got as, as terrible a news as I've ever had. Um, and we sat down in a room with, with two doctors, my wife and I, and we heard um, the only thing that can be done for your son is a heart transplant. Hmm. Um, you know, and he's seven or eight days old, and... You're like, oh, no. And that'll change your perspective in a hurry. Um, So, but, and I'll fast forward a little bit. So, you know, he, well, let me, let me just say this. It was, it was the worst, it was the worst uh, moment probably to that point of my life. And I think my wife would probably say the same thing. And yet in that moment, um, there was a there was a hope too. Not even necessarily that we were going to get the outcome we wanted, although I wanted that with all my heart. Um, no, no pun intended. Was I wanted a healthy uh, boy? Yeah. Um, but in that moment, we also recognized this. Um, two months before he was born, my wife Shannon had gone to Arkansas Children's Hospital in Little Rock, where I'm from, uh, and where we met and married. Uh, and she had gotten a second opinion on this initial three surgeries diagnosis. And so she had met with all the different doctors at Arkansas Children's Hospital. She had, uh, uh, including their, their cardiac surgeon. And they all said, based on the available information, um, yes, the doctors in Portland are right. Go back to Portland, have him do that. So now here we are sitting here in this, in this room, having just gotten this news delivered to us. All that's out the window he needs a heart transplant. And at that moment, I was comforted by this. Um, I knew God was in control. We knew God was good, whatever he brought. And we've been telling ourselves that whatever he brings, he's good and it will be good. And we will proclaim that truth to the world and to ourselves, whatever happens. Hmm. Uh, and it sounds trite to say God's good, whatever he brings, um, you know, eight years later, but we were saying that at the time without knowing how things would go. And in that moment, I was comforted by knowing God was in control. And here's, here's how. Here's one little way I knew he was in control. So that cardiac surgeon from Little Rock um, that Shannon had met uh, was a renowned heart surgeon. And um, just so happened that that day in Portland, they had uh, their cardiac team had trailing them and consulting them. This guy from Little Rock, who was a renowned heart heart surgeon from Arkansas Children's Hospital, mm-hmm. and so he sat in with them when they sat down to decide what can we do with this little baby that's just crashed. And I don't have any reason to put that doctor in that hospital in that meeting, um, right. you know, uh, for on that day. And, you know, and I don't write fiction, even though coaches sometimes would accuse you of doing that. Right. But, <laughs> but if I were a screenwriter and I and I just sort of dropped the doctor that my wife had just met with two months ago in you know, 2000 miles away into that setting, then uh, it would be 
sort of somebody would say, you got to come up with a better reason for him to be there. But I knew what the reason was in that moment. And the reason was, I mean, there were multiple reasons that I'll never know, obviously. But one reason was God was saying, I'm here and I'm in control. And he was telling that to me. Um, and 40 days later, that doctor transplanted a heart into my son, Christopher. Wow. And, and I'm just telling you, there were, there were things like that. It didn't say, God didn't say, I'm about to give you the outcome you want. Um, but he showed us he was in control. He didn't need to show us. I mean, we knew that, but then all of a sudden we knew it. And, um, I'm just so thankful for that. Uh, the, the rest of the story is he needs a heart transplant. We don't do pediatric heart transplants here in Portland. You, your, your choices are Seattle, um, Stanford down in the Bay area, or, um, uh, there was an option in Southern California and we didn't know anybody in all those places. And so my wife said, what do you think about Little Rock and Arkansas Children's Hospital? And even though that doctor had been there, they were like, well, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense to us. Um, and it was obviously out of network, um, just the way insurance works. And, and we were like, we'd really like this to happen. And, and this was a moment when I just said, God, I don't know what to do. Just help. And about an hour later, they said, it's in network. We'll send you to Little Rock. And then they needed... Um, then they needed to figure out how to send him there. And the, and the, uh, the medical transport, basically they load a bunch of doctors in an incubator and, and all the machines you need into a private plane and they'll send, they'll, they'll come get him, but it's going to be upwards of $45,000 and the insurance is not going to pay for that. Hmm. And so I said, you know, I kind of gulped and I said, all right, I don't, I don't know how we'll do this, but Lord help. And an hour later, the two hospitals agreed to eat the costs together. Wow. And I don't know why that stuff happens yeah. other than God's in control. And he had a, he had a plan for some reason for Christopher. And even at that time, didn't know whether he would, uh, you know, get a heart or ultimately survive or what any of that would mean. But, um, you know, but it was like, wow, Lord, you are in control here. And this is a terrible, terrible day. And I'm barely holding it together, but you're showing me your control and you are holding me together. Um, so as I said, when he was seven weeks old, uh, they that that surgeon transplanted the heart into him. And it, listen, I could we could go week after week after week and talk about how how God sustained Christopher and how God sustained us. Um, to make a long story a little shorter, um, his kidneys failed on the heart lung bypass machine, and so we went months and months hoping they would return, and then understanding they wouldn't, and he was on dialysis, and it was a very tenuous time, and. Um, there was a return to Portland to the children's hospital involved there. And when he was 11 months old, he finally came home to Eugene on 18 hours of dialysis a day. Hmm. Uh, but he was home, uh, and God sustained him and God sustained us and gave us strength. And when he was 22 months old, just two months shy of his second birthday, um, he, uh, he was able to get a kidney and, um, I'm the, I'm the donor. My wife was also a, a match, and if he, if and when he needs another one, she she'll be the the first to mm -hmm. to go there. But um, and I always tell people, um, you know, God's wired it into the hearts of fathers to do good for their children. It's it's only what everybody else would do for their son if he, if if he could do it. Um, Did you ever hesitate at all, George, in that moment, to, not to to give your kidney? I mean, not that um, you know you're less worried, I guess, about your health. You're, you're doing whatever it takes to help your son. But was there any hesitancy at all? Because that's a big deal when you're giving a kidney, donating a kidney. There really wasn't. Um, good. There really wasn't, and uh, uh, you know, and I don't know why. Maybe there should have been, but there wasn't. And I really believe that. I mean, in in Luke 11. Um, God's, uh, Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray and it's not the point of the passage, but it's sort of just in the passage, just sort of assumed as a matter of course, you're talking about, he, he's talking about how, you know, um, you know, if, if fathers give good things to their children, meaning earthly fathers give good things to their children, how much more will, you know, God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Yeah. And I had studied that passage because during the whole situation from before he was born throughout this long uh, saga, God was teaching me how to pray. And so I'd studied that passage and it just was like, you know, yeah, God has wired it into the hearts of fathers. Again, it's that's just sort of an assumed point in the passage, not the point of the passage. He's wired it in the hearts of fathers to do good things for their children. And I don't, it, it really was not a, an issue for me at all. If I was going to be a match and I hoped I was, 
I would give him a kidney. Um, so, so anyway, Christopher at 22 months suddenly began to flourish. Uh, and he's, you know, eight, almost nine now. And he's a, he's a, a little boy who, uh, loves life and he's a little bit behind his peers, but, um, loves life. He loves football. He loves sports. Um, he's the one of my three who is the, the most like me in terms of just sort of loving every single thing about, um, sports and about, you know, college sports, for example. But I mean, you know, God's just been so kind to us. And by the way, as I said, he would have been good if Christopher had died and if Christopher's life is short and struggling, God's good. And if it's long and, um, healthy, which is what I pray for, God's good. And we just pray that it brings glory to God. A lot Um, of people see stories like this, George, and they think, how can, how can you say that? In in essence, I guess people maybe who aren't Christians and even some who are, uh, and have faith will say, how can you say that? Because how is, how is a good God going to still be good if he say takes away my kid or whatever? Right. And we see tragedy a lot and people ask that a lot and question that a lot. Can you take me through just how you were able to come to that point? Because I have to imagine in the moments when you're hearing this, especially early on with Christopher, there has to be moments and maybe there wasn't. But I guess for me, I'm thinking about my daughter now. I only have one child. She's 14. Like I would probably have some anger issues with God. I mean, maybe not question him, but I would have a lot of anger issues with what are you doing here, God? How did you kind of talk about a little bit more about what you mean? Because you say God is good. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. Yeah, well, I mean, we we and and I'm not sure that I completely understand all the theological underpinnings of that. I just I think there's a faith that God gives you that allows you to have faith, and there's a uh, there's a strength that He gives you to set to to believe that. And then there are times when you know, as I said, God's good, whatever He brings, we're preaching it to ourselves. You know, you're doubting or you're angry or you're whatever, but you're saying, I know you're good God. And, and there were some tenuous moments in that, you know, I kind of glossed over those months yeah. between the heart transplant and when he was able to receive the kidney. Um, there were some times when we thought he wouldn't make it. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't have a great answer for that other than he is good. And I read in his word that he's good. Um, I read that in Psalm 100, uh, yesterday. I don't have it right in front of me, but that, uh, that, God is good. And so you have to trust that he's good. And, um, you know, I just, I I know that my desires for Christopher or my desires for me or anything else might not be God's plan. Um, so I had just purposed to thank God, whatever he brought. And, And I'm so thankful I haven't had to thank him after losing Christopher, but you know, that could happen at some point or some other thing could befall us. Uh, and, and I pray that God will give me the strength to thank him. Um, here's the other thing too. There were times when all I could pray was God help. And at that point I understood the truth that we don't usually understand, which is um, I can't do anything here. Only you can God. And so I was desperate and dependent and helpless. But the, but the thing about that is Jason, I'm always desperate and dependent and helpless. God sustains. It's easy for me to see that God sustains every heartbeat that Christopher has. It's easy for me to see that before he got the new heart, that he sustained every heartbeat of that malformed original heart. It's, it's, it's easy for me to see when I see the scar, the vertical scar in his chest or the other scars that are on his torso from the various other surgeries, um, how God is still sustaining him. But here's the deal. As far as I know, I'm healthy and God's sustaining every single heartbeat I have right now. And he's sustaining every single heartbeat you're having right now. And he's sustaining every single heartbeat of the people who are listening to this podcast right now. He is sustaining you. You are dependent on him. You know, we learned that um, in Christ, Christ holds all things together, he says in Colossians. Paul says in Colossians. And and that includes my life. And so uh, I think through this journey, I've just sort of seen at different times the dependency that I actually have all the time. And that we actually have all the time. It's true of us uh, at all times, you know. And so um, I've learned that God's completely and totally dependable. Not not that I'm going to get what I want. Um, not that I'm going to get, you know, what I think I need. 
um, but that he's dependable and, 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 and I am dependent on him. Have you seen, as you shared your story and maybe you haven't shared it in a ton of places. I mean, you, you're a writer, so you tell stories all the time, uh, in what you're doing. You're a storyteller and you're a reporter. So in a weird way, is it, have you seen how your story with Christopher has been able to impact others? Have you been able to see any kind of fruit of that or evidence of that other than the obvious of it's impacting me just listening to you tell it, but just, I guess, through the years on, it's been what, six years now, I guess, since, uh, you donated the kidney to your son. Have you yes, seen seven, actually seven mm-hmm. years? Have you been mm-hmm. able to tell others about that and, and maybe just be an encouragement to them? Well, I have, and there've been, there've been people that have gone through not necessarily exactly the same thing, but things with their children, which I think God, uh, you know, gives you the, uh, gives, gives, opens those doors sometimes to be able to talk to people. And, um, you know, the hard thing is, uh, being able to share with people and then the outcome is different. Um, and that's one of the things I'm always aware of. That's why I sort of made that disclaimer. I, I believe God is good, whatever he brings. Mm-hmm. I understand it could sound trite because here we are on the other side of things and things are going great, but we really meant it at the time. Yeah. Um, but God has given me opportunities to share with people on an individual basis who've had children or uh, that they're, that are going through things, medical situations, or, you know, other situations that have, you know, that are just adverse. The other thing that, that he's given me is this, and I kind of got into it just a little bit when I talk about the, how God sustains our every heartbeat is listen, a heart transplant specifically. Um, it's, that is a picture and very imperfect picture, but a picture of what God does for us in salvation. Yeah. And, and so God has, um, one of the things, and this is never about me, but one of the things that God has done for me through this is he's given me a testimony with a word, with sort of a word picture of what salvation is. Um, you know, we learn in Ezekiel 36 that we have this heart of stone and that God will get, wants to give us a heart of flesh. Mm. Um, you know, and we, we see in Ephesians 2 that um, we were dead in our sins, and, but God, being rich in mercy, made us alive together in Christ. And that's the picture of how we go from death to life and salvation. And so I can, I can tell people, you know, Christopher's heart wasn't dead, but it was leading him to death. And, and he ended up with a new heart that made him alive and gave him a chance. And it's God's mercy that brought him there. Um, and that's an imperfect picture, as I said, of what Christ does for us in salvation. The other piece of that is this, and we hadn't talked about this earlier, but I know where that heart came from. I mean, I don't know specifically where it came from, but um, another infant passed away. And it's really hard for me to, to get my mind around. Right. Some, some set of parents, even as we were having the joy of a heart being transplanted, were, were in the worst place of their lives, I would think mourning the loss of their baby and yet they gave the gift of life to us and so i'm so thankful to them i hope one day we get to 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 meet them i was going to ask if Uh, you ever met them or know who the family is have not uh hope to at some point you know that's one of the situations where it ends up being up to that donor family right so um i pray that that i can do that but we i prayed for them as god has brought them to mind and even at that point so i I mean that's a hard thing I, i bring that up to say this you know, salvation um, required the death of Jesus to pay for my sins. So even that analogy there is there was a death involved um, to bring that new heart to my son. So it, long answer to your short question, um, not only in individual circumstances where we've been able to comfort and hopefully, um, um, you know, help and even tell people, about um, Christ as they were going through those hurting situations. But I have a testimony now that I've been able to share with people um, in various settings, um, whether it's, you know, three people or 15 people or 50 people or whatever, yeah. um, you know, whether it's a five minute, Hey, let me tell you what happened here. And here's how this relates or 15 minutes or 30 minutes. God's given me the, the ability to have a personal analogy of what salvation is like. And again, it's imperfect, but it's, but it's 
but it, you know, it, it relates, I think. George, thanks so much for joining us here on the podcast. Your story is awesome. Um, and certainly we continue to wish Christopher and your two other children, Elizabeth and George and your wife, uh, just uh, wish them all nothing but the best and wish you nothing but the best. And hopefully we'll talk again soon. Hey, thank you, Jason. I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. And many thanks to George Schroeder from USA Today for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Loved his story. I really did. As a dad, I mean, you just you just can completely empathize and understand what George was going through uh, with his son, Christopher, how much he loves him, how much uh, he cares for him, how he would do anything for him, literally giving his kidney to his son, Christopher, who's now eight, going to be nine years old on November 30th. And we wish Christopher, and we're continuing to pray for him and the whole Schroeder family, and we wish George nothing but the best. Thank him for joining us here on the podcast. Make sure you reach out to George. Let him know that you heard his story, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and, of course, share this podcast. Let people know about the stories that we're telling on the intersection of sports and faith. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. Reach us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can email me, Jason, at Sports Spectrum. Com and all of our podcasts through iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts. There's a way you can subscribe and leave a review. We'd love to have you do that as well. Let people know what you think of the podcast. And then share it. Share it on your pages, on your Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is. Share these stories of sports and faith with everyone you know. We appreciate you. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast.